Welcome, my name's uh, Richard Moorhead. I'm the director of the Centre for Ethics and Law here at uh, UCL's Faculty of Law. Uh, the centre's interests spread across professional ethics, business and ethics, and technology and ethics. We have a range of projects in the fields of virtual reality, tax, corporate governance, the ethics and values of law students. Uh, we laugh. <laughs> The results are to come, it is quite interesting. Uh, ethics in the world of finance and medicine and a soon to be launched project on the ethical leadership of, uh, f for and by lawyers. Um, we're supported in that work by UCL, of course, our colleagues, the, the Legal Education Foundation and our sponsors, British Aerospace, Norton Rose, Fulbright, EY, HSBC uh, and Carillion. And I take the opportunity now to thank them for their long standing support now as it is long standing for the centre. And of course, some of those names will remind us that the issues faced by or involving business are large, important, and sometimes controversial. And getting those issues wrong damages the economy, but it also damages sometimes our social fabric. But also engaging with business and the professions we believe helps us to do what we hope is sometimes important work, and that through engagement, progress can sometimes be made. It also helps us bring some of the world's leading thinkers, and I mean leading thinkers, on ethics, business and professionalism here to UCL. And tonight we have uh, a shining example of that. I really cannot exaggerate the sense of excitement and interest generated uh, across academic, student, professional and business communities on hearing that Professor Ruggie was coming to teach tonight. It really was I was delighted when, uh, when John said yes, but the reaction that I got when we told people about it was really uh, both unusual and extremely heartwarming. Now, part of that excitement is derived directly from the experience of the man. So, John's Bertolt Weiss, Professor in Human Rights and International Affairs at Kennedy School of Government, an affiliated professor at Harvard Law, Harvard Law School, a political scientist by background, uh, renowned for his work in international relations, globalisation and the emergence of, and this is what I think is one of the really interesting things for us as lawyers, new rulemakings. His long association with the UN established the UN Global Compact and in June 2011 the UN Principles on Business and Human Rights. And for those of you who haven't re read John's book, Just Business, uh, it's uh, both an exceptionally insightful and thoughtful book and a very readable, readable uh, book and it's in five languages I hear so you can take your pick of languages. <laughs> Uh, too. I, I thoroughly recommend the book. And as well as the man, it's the breadth and I think the interest of his ideas that he's developed that really has stimulated the excitement that we got back when we announced the event. Uh, he'll talk, I'm sure, about principles, pragmatism devoted to the idea of progress, polycentric regulation for those of us interested in regulation, and what I would describe as a sort of deft, complex, and controversial approach to lawyers' favourite tool rules. Um, his approach is merely to seek to orchestrate meaningful and significant behavioural change on a global chain, uh, on a global scale. Easy job. I'm trying to persuade my daughter to do French GCSE rather than art, so we have a sense of the relative. Uh, <laughs> our relative ambitions. He lays down challenges for business and professions, and I'm sure we are promised an absolutely fascinating uh, evening. So I give you, ladies and gentlemen, Professor John. Brother. Thank you. for that wonderful introduction. I'm sorry my mother wasn't here to hear it. <laughs> she, might have, she might have believed you. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm so pleased to see you all here. Um, it's a great honor to, uh, to be here tonight. Um, I've had an interesting week so far um, uh, in London. Um, I actually got to meet the Queen the other night at Buckingham Palace at a reception. Um, and, uh, but that was not the highlight. The highlight is tonight. Uh, actually, there's a funny story that goes along with the, the reception at Buckingham Palace. Uh, an officer presents uh, people to the Queen, one after another, there was a queue. And uh, so he bellows out Professor John Ruggie, Harvard University, to the Queen said, Harvard? And I wasn't quite sure why there was a question mark at the end, <laughs> at the end of that. So I, um, uh, I said, yes, it's, it's America's oldest university, <laughs> but by UK standards, very young. Yeah. 
and I thought I detected the slight trace of a smile. <laughs> and she shook my hand, and that was it. Uh, but it, it was great fun. But I look forward to tonight because what, what I what I what I want to do, and, and I hope I get it done in time, um, is is to is to reflect on a, on a journey, uh, a 15 year journey. Um, uh, in the area of business and human rights, um, uh, in in, um, uh, in spheres in which I've been personally involved, um, but I'm, I'm now trying to sort of uh, move back up the ladder of, of analysis um, and, and um, to um, explain to myself and then to others: um, Is there a theory of change here? Um, are there are there analytical lessons to be drawn from this experience? Um, and, and, and if so, what are they? And uh, so uh, it's a particular pleasure uh, for me to be able uh, to do this, uh, to share this with you uh, tonight. Um, so let me just jump right in, if I, um, where, do, where, do I where, where do I point this um, to begin with? <laughs> this is the right meaning of mine. Uh, and then I have it upside down. Yeah, I did, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't tweet. <laughs> um, so the prognosis, it, it, we, we, all, we all know what the, a major fundamental transformation in the global economy took off in the 1980s, right? Um, through uh, uh, new rules that enabled um, the vast expansion um, of global markets and market actors, um, uh, the, uh, the effects of, of liberalization, privatization, deregulation, uh, economic reforms in China, the collapse of the Soviet Union, etc., etc., um, and um, um, rules were put in place to allow market actors uh, to act globally um, with assurance that there were legal protections. Bilateral investment treaties created an investment regime uh, whereby uh, investors can sue governments for uh, violations of. Uh, the, um, of, of the investment treaty. International uh, property rights um, were established through the WTO, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the externalities of corporate globalization lag behind, or dealing with the externalities, I should say, lag behind. The social and environmental consequences have been inadequately dealt with. And among those social and environmental consequences, um, where uh, uh, was the issue of, of the adverse impact of corporate globalization on the enjoyment of human rights. Uh, and that's the story that I want to reflect on tonight, um, where we um, have come from um, and where we might be going. Now, there are traditional ways that were put forward um, of how to deal with this challenge. One, you know, let's, and this particular favorite of, of, of some people in the, in, the, in the legal field, we create a single overarching legal regime to govern multinational corporations. Um, this, the effort goes back to the 1970s. There was a 15 or 16 year so-called negotiation before it collapsed and was abandoned. Um, it didn't work, it failed. In the late 1990s, early 2000s, um, a sub-commission of uh, what was then the Commission on Human Rights, now the Council, uh, developed a set of draft uh, norms on transnational corporations and other business enterprises. It failed as well. Um, a second um, um, sort of traditional approach is self-regulation, which was much, public much publicized, pushed by governments, um, and by many international agencies. And in fact, there has been an extraordinary increase um, in self-regulatory systems or multi-stakeholder uh, initiatives um, on the global scale, but they too have problems. They, they're still limited in numbers, but more important um, is the self-definition of obligations. Companies define for themselves what they will be obligated to do. Uh, there is little external accountability and uh, there is no effective remedy uh, for harm done. Uh, the third is um, extraterritorial jurisdiction by home states. So pressuring the British government to uh, uh, allow plaintiffs from other countries to come to British courts uh, and bring cases against uh, British companies uh, for um, uh, bad things that, uh, that their uh, subsidiaries or affiliates overseas do. This 
has limited possibilities. It's not a general solution. We can talk about what the limited possibilities are. So the bottom line for me has been that there is no single silver bullet. Um, we've got to think in more complex um, ways about these issues. So what, what I'm, I'm going to focus on tonight um, is uh, my reflections on three UN initiatives. Um, I was personally involved in, 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 in a leadership capacity in the first two. Uh, in the third, I'm involved as an advocate um, 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 in, in, um, in debates, uh, but not in any uh, official uh, capacity. The first was the UN Global Compact, uh, which um, I'll, I'll talk about um, um, in, in, in a minute. Uh, second, Richard has already referred to the uh, UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. Um, and um, there, uh, there will start sometime this year um, negotiations um, on a um, business and human rights treaty in the context of the UN Human Rights Council. Now, the story that I want to tell about the Global Compact is that its contribution has been to expand cognitive and institutional frames. Okay? Remember that line? I'll come back to it in a minute. The guiding principles are an example of standard setting through polycentric governance, and I'll explain what I mean by that. And on the subject of the treaty, my argument has been that the idea of um, being able to shoehorn the entire area of business and human rights into a single treaty instrument is delusional. Um, to put it gently. Um, uh, but there might be um, uh, possibilities um, for further international legalization through what I call precision tools. That is to say, very targeted legal instruments that build on the other two. Now, the, the, theor the theory of change that, that sort of jumps out at me as I reflect on this experience is that it's, 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 it's difficult to move forward unless cognitive and institutional frames of reference are expanded. Um, and, 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 and people begin to see connections among things that they didn't see before. Uh, that doesn't necessarily lead to behavioral change, but it does lead to a more complex understanding um, of challenges. Um, and the, uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, second is building on those expanded cognitive and institutional frames um, to, um, in, in a standard setting body that involves multiple stakeholders. And, and the third then is uh, translating uh, soft law agreements into specific hard law um, uh, obligations. So let me begin with the Global Compact. The year was um, 1999, um, and Kofi Annan was Secretary General of the United Nations. Um, and, um, gave a speech uh, to the um, assembled business leaders, uh, the um, theme of which was, if we cannot make globalization work for everyone, in the end it will work for none. Um, and so he challenged the business community itself uh, to, um, uh, through their, their own uh, firms, through their business associations, uh, to um, uh, enact, embrace, uh, support, a set of core values in the area of human rights, labor standards, uh, and environmental practices. The reception was very positive, and we were actually uh, obliged to turn this into a program, even though it was initially conceived just simply as a speech. Uh, and that often happens. Speeches do lead, do have consequences um, when, uh, when, when the reaction um, is relatively positive. Now, the UN Global Compact, and as it was established, this is from an old um, um, uh, slide, this is what it, what it said it was intended to do, is to, um, is to work with businesses to mainstream 10 principles uh, that were drawn from international conventions in the area of labor standards, human rights, uh, environment, uh, and, and corruption, and to, get, to catalyze actions in support of broader UN goals, including the Millennium Development Goals. Um, it, it was um, a corporate uh, participation is initiated by the CEO uh, sending a letter, which often requires board approval, and it was endorsed by the General Assembly after the fact. We did our best to keep the hands of governments off this for the first two years, because we knew they'd screw it up. That's a scientific term. 
Now, I'm not going to go through this, um, but I want to, uh, uh, just a couple of highlights. Today, there are 8,000 business participants in 160 countries. Uh, there are 4,000 non-business participants, and the various stakeholders are listed uh, at the top. And I think critically important that Global Compact has established national networks uh, in a number of countries, including throughout the emerging market countries. Um, I visited um, the um, national network in Brazil uh, not long ago, and it's extremely active um, and um, is doing um, um, what I will explain um, in a second um, the Global Compact, in my judgment, was intended to do. Now, there's a standard critique of the Global Compact, and it's been there since day one. And the standard critique is that it has no teeth. Okay? Um, so it provides companies with opportunities for blue washing. Blue washing is the, you know, blue is the UN color. It's the equivalent of whitewashing, but only blue. Um, it, it, um, and, and, and it's arguable um, uh, that there are such opportunities, except that the Global Compact has um, expelled, they call it delisted, 4,000 companies over, over uh, uh, its, its life. Um, for, for non-performance um, uh, 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 in regards to uh, the expectations. Um, it has um, admitted companies with dubious records. Um, when the Global Compact was first launched, there was a press conference, uh, and Kofi Annan presented the ideas to the press, and he had with him um, uh, I, uh, the, lead, the head of Amnesty International at the time, the head of the International uh, Confederation of Trade Unions, and Phil Knight, the CEO of Nike. Right? This was the year 2000. First question from a reporter was, Secretary General, you're standing next to Phil Knight. Isn't that like supping with the devil? And Kofi Annan, without batting an eyelash, said, the angels don't need our help. <laughs> um, now, the, the Global Compact lacks teeth. And so the, the point that I want the question I want to ask is lacking teeth the only appropriate benchmark for an initiative of this sort? Uh, and my answer is a resounding no. Uh, first of all, it was never intended as a regulatory instrument. It was intended to create, enlarge, and empower coalitions of the willing. That's a legitimate objective in its own right. It's important to create coalitions of the willing um, and to support them uh, through, through various means. So how does the Global Compact do that? My reconstruction of its contribution is that there are sort of three basic elements. One, it serves as a learning forum, literally for sharing best practices, for sharing dilemmas um, among companies in, in interaction with uh, trade unions, uh, in interaction um, with NGOs, um, and other stakeholders. Uh, it promotes public-private partnerships. Some can be very problematic, um, but uh, there's no way we're going to eliminate poverty or reduce poverty significantly in the world uh, without, without private-public partnerships. So uh, they're, they're, they're here to stay. They're an important element, and we need to make sure that they work well. Um, and it generated, it has generated and continues to very innovative spin-offs. Let me give some examples. Just and I could have picked any number, but so for uh, under the learning forum, for for example, there uh, guidance has been developed for uh, best practices of company operations in conflict zones. Right? Um, there is um, an anti-corruption tools um, inventory. There is a human rights self-assessment tool for companies. That's learning. Um, uh, that's a learning forum uh, a function. Uh, it's, it, it actually uh, also has tried um, to uh, engage business schools. Um, Richard was making a joke about law schools before. Um, business schools are a far bigger challenge. Um, they, they have things called ethics, um, courses called ethics, um, which, uh, I should, I should, is this being taped? <laughs> um, it basically means don't get caught. Um, promotes public-private partnerships. Um, the Global Compact is the private sector lead for the post-2015 development goals. What's going to be the role of the private sector um, in helping to, uh, to 
achieve uh, environmental um, uh, sustainability and social sustainability. Uh, generates innovative spin-offs. Principles for Responsible Investment was one of the early spin-offs. Today, 1,325 uh, investment institutions um, committed to incorporating environmental, social, and governance issues um, into their um, analysis and into their ownership policies and practices. Caring for climate is another uh, example. Uh, 60, um, uh, 60 countries, 400 CEOs, not only set internal carbon prices in the companies, but publicly advocate for carbon pricing policies. So, if, if that's uh, the, the um, um, oh, I have one more. You all know what this is, right? Bloomberg Terminal. Every Bloomberg terminal now allows you to see whether a company has subscribed to the Global Compact and it gives you access to its annual um, communication on progress. Now, this, every financial professional has one of this sitting on his or her desk. This doesn't look or smell or taste like a regulatory instrument. So my point is, let's stop assessing it as one and try to assess it for what it actually is or attempts to do, which is the analytical reprise here to expand cognitive and institutional horizons and, and to connect things better, to establish and, and, and connect and support communities of practice. There is a tendency um, of, of outsiders to black box companies to treat them as unitary actors, the way in international relations theory we, we treat states sometimes as unitary actors. And we know that states are not unitary actors. Well, companies are not unitary actors either. There's now an army of committed people who come from schools like mine, the Kennedy School, who work in companies because they want to contribute to society, not because they're interested uh, in maximizing their personal uh, gain. Um, it seeks to leverage the influence of these communities of practice within firms and beyond. And, and lastly, the corporate social responsibility discourse, if you will, has become totally normalized. Um, and importantly, in, in, in emerging market countries, um, through the national networks um, and, and, and the like. And so, um, there's a good question here that um, actually make, makes a good uh, thesis topic. Um, how well does the Global Compact perform the guide, the guide dog rather than the watchdog function? Um, and we really don't know because most of the studies that have been done treat it as though it were a poor substitute for a regulatory instrument, which it wasn't intended to be. Okay? That's, my, that's the first sort of lesson that I want to draw uh, tonight. Now let me move on to uh, chapter two, um, which is the guiding principles um, on business and human rights, um, which in a sense built on um, some, some of the foundational work that the Global Compact uh, has done, but goes well beyond it. Um, the guiding principles on business and human right, right, uh, rights implements um, or, or provides guidance for implementing the United Nations Protect, Respect, and Remedy um, framework. The state duty to protect against human rights abuses by third parties, including business. Uh, the corporate responsibility to respect human rights, which means to not infringe on the rights of others as they go about their business. Um, and the need for greater uh, access to effective remedy on the part of those who are harmed. Now, um, the, the origins of this um, where was, in fact, the, 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 the failure of the, the, the so-called norms. Uh, governments wanted to keep the issue alive, um, um, even though they didn't like the norms, and so they asked the Secretary General to appoint a special representative. My mandate initially was very modest. It was to identify and clarify things. I, nobody asked me to regulate anybody or to propose regulation. It was to identify and clarify um, applicable standards, uh, such concepts as corporate complicity uh, in human rights abuses, uh, corporate sphere of influence, what does it mean, where are the boundaries, 
Um, and so initially it was thought of as a sort of a desk-based mandate uh, that would advise um, the, um, the Human Rights Council um, on um, uh, uh, further steps that it might consider. So it was um, initially a three-year mandate, and I, I, I was invited to make recommendations, and I made only one. I said, uh, please, um, I want you to um, agree that a, a framework that I proposed, the Protect, Respect, and Remedy framework, is an appropriate way to conceive of the challenge of how to respond to business and human rights uh, issues um, uh, to uh, um, the roles, the respective roles of governments and business and other stakeholders. And I only made one proposal because I thought that a, the, the parameters and the perimeters, if I may call it that, of the issue needed to be well defined in an authoritative fashion. So uh, the, um, in, in its wisdom, um, the council welcomed this framework and because no good deed goes unpunished, uh, they expanded the mandate by another three years um, and asked me to operationalize this framework. And that's how the guiding principles uh, came into, into being. Let me t t uh, draw some of the analytical lessons from um, the guiding principles. The foundation, as Richard already signaled, rests on uh, the, the recognition that if, when you look out at the world of, of, uh, of, 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 of globalization, uh, in fact, companies are affected or companies' conduct is affected, shaped by three different governance systems. Not just one, three. One is the traditional public governance system. Um, the legislation and regulation and judicial action at the national level, uh, whatever agreements countries reach uh, internationally, uh, and so on and so forth. That's one governance system. The second is a system of civil governance, which operates through social compliance mechanisms rather than through traditional public law and government um, uh, mechanisms. Social compliance mechanisms such as campaigns, lawsuits, other forms of pressure put on companies, also partnering with companies um, uh, in order to uh, solve problems collectively. And the third is corporate governance. Now, you run immediately on a, on a, on a, on in, in, in terms of, of the legal structure uh, of, corporate, of corporations into the separate, the corporate veil problem, the, the separate legal personality is, uh, 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 issue uh, and limited liability. Uh, and, and the corporations will always insist, well, that was an affiliate or that was a subsidiary, you can't go after the parent company, and sometimes you can, but not very often. Um, so that's, that's one element of this um, corporate governance system. But you also recognize that companies do have a single um, a vision and, um, they, uh, and a, a, a single uh, global strategy for how to compete in the global market, which includes um, a, um, a, um, a risk management, enterprise-wide risk management systems. Um, and, and which increasingly have been translated into private law regimes through contracts, right? And so um, there, there are sort of two ways then to get at this. One is by, uh, by trying to pierce the corporate veil, um, as it were. Uh, the other is to insinuate yourself into the enterprise-wide systems, particularly the enterprise-wide risk management systems. Um, and um, that's a, 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 a focus um, that, um, or an element that I particularly focused on in developing the guiding principles. Now, the challenge that I saw was then trying to align these three governance systems better behind a common normative framework so that they would pull in the same direction as opposed to being simply sort of fragments floating around um, out there. And to do that, the guiding principles draw on, on very different rationales um, that speak to 
each of the governance systems in their own language, as it were. So for, for states, the emphasis of the guiding principles is on the legal obligations they have under the international human rights regimes and on policy rationales um, that, that, that help advance um, those uh, legal um, um, obligations or are consistent with uh, uh, or supportive of those legal obligations. So this had never really been spelled out authoritatively um, in the business and human rights field. Um, what's, what, if, if, if states, if, if the United Kingdom has adopted all the human rights conventions, what does that mean for various agencies of the British government? What does it mean for the Export Credit Agency? Uh, should the Export Credit Agency uh, um, not act in a manner that is consistent with the legal obligations under the human rights regime that the UK has uh, subscribed to? Um, and so on and so forth through various governance functions. Now for business, the rationale is very different. Beyond compliance with legal obligations, the guiding principles uh, focus on the need to manage the risk of involvement um, in human rights abuses and to address harm where it occurs. A part of the enterprise-wide risk management system. And for uh, affected individuals and communities, um, further empowerment through the guiding principles to realize a right to remedy. So different discourses brought together to speak to the different governance systems, but trying to align them behind, um, as I say, a common uh, normative framework. Um, and the 31 guiding principles and commentary spell out the meaning and the implications um, of this. And let me take the second pillar, the corporate responsibility to respect human rights, as an example. So, the what for business. What are you supposed to do? It's simple. Well, it's not simple. Um, it can be described in simple terms, but it's very complicated in practice. A responsibility to respect, conduct your business without infringing on the human rights of others that you um, affect. Um, includes, um, in principle, all internationally recognized rights. Um, there's no rhyme or reason to segregate out um, um, any particular uh, rights. By all business practice, uh, by all business enterprises. Now, here, um, there was a strategic um, question that was posed to the business community. And by the way, this was all done in the context of nearly 50 multi-stakeholder uh, uh, consultations <coughs> all around the globe, right? So active participation by business and civil society uh, and, and labor uh, as well. Um, the strategic question to the business community was, look, you all tell me that you respect human rights. You put on your website that you respect human rights. You sign up to the Global Compact that says you respect human rights. I've never seen a company say we don't respect human rights. <laughs> My question to you as a business community is, how do you know? How do you know that you respect human rights? Do you have systems in place that would allow you to say with any degree of confidence that you respect human rights. Can you persuade yourself? Can you persuade anybody else? And the answer, of course, is no, we don't have such systems in place. And that was the opening. Okay, we will tell you what those systems should look like. Okay, so we didn't argue the principle. We accepted that companies claimed that they respect human rights. But we said you can't say that you respect human rights if you, if you don't know and can't show that you respect human rights. Okay, so we move on then to uh, 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 the systems um, through which uh, you need to do that. All internationally recognized rights. Here's another doctrinal debate that we managed to avoid. Um, the prior debate by, in, it's in the business community was, this human rights stuff, it's all, it's, it's all states. It doesn't apply to us, right? And international human rights law uh, covers the conduct of states. We comply with domestic laws wherever we operate. International human rights law is not directly applicable to companies. Um, I didn't want to get involved in that doctrinal debate. I said, okay, you're responsible to, uh, for complying with all applicable laws. 
period, domestic, international, I, I, doesn't matter to me. Um, but look at all internationally recognized rights, not as um, laws that you might violate, but as an authoritative list of human rights that you can harm. And, oh, okay, that works. So there's an authoritative list that we can turn to. All business enterprises, irrespective of size, context, whatever. All right, so that was the what for business. The next question was the how. And here we, uh, with, with the, um, uh, 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 the, the help of actually um, um, a, a, a large um, community of, of corporate lawyers, designed the basic elements of what we call human rights due diligence. That what you need in place is an effective human rights due diligence system, which operates roughly in the following manner. It's aimed at non-infringement. It's based on engaging stakeholders. And the first thing that you do is to identify what your adverse impacts are <laughs> Um, in different operating contexts, um, uh, the, your, your, your adverse impacts um, on people. Evaluate their severity um, and then prioritize your action based on uh, that um, the notion of, of severity. Um, incorporate findings into relevant business functions. What does it mean for your human resources department? What does it, what does it mean for your operational people? What does it mean for the transportation department? Um, and so on and so forth. Um, prevent and mitigate potential in adverse impacts and remedy actual um, impacts. Um, on uh, the theory, or the uh, maxim, I should say, that you can't manage what you can't measure, develop indicators. Measure the effectiveness of your policies. That's all part of the due diligence process. Um, and then communicate. Inform stakeholders uh, and uh, report um, through your sustainability report or whatever um, on um, uh, the uh, risks uh, that you face and the challenges that you are dealing with. Um, one more um, step in this um, um, sequence, um, there, there, there was um, a need, how should I put this, there was a need to differentiate what companies were expected to do depending on their relationship to the harm committed. So um, if the business actually caused the human rights harm itself, you know, there's a saying in the US, uh, if you break it, you own it. Um, if you're the direct cause, fix it. Um, if you contributed to a cause that was actually, uh, if you contributed to a harm that was actually caused by another, your obligation is slightly different. What do I mean by contributed to? Um, one uh, a terrific example comes from Apple. Uh, iPhone 5, it's right here in my pocket. Um, the contractor, of course, was Foxconn uh, in China, 1.3 million uh, employees. Um, Apple, um, Steve Jobs decided um, a, a short time before the delivery of the iPhone 5 was due but he didn't like the screen, and he wanted the screen changed. He didn't, he didn't say, okay, there, we, we, can, we can accommodate a later delivery date. He didn't say, we'll pay more. Uh, and so the fact, uh, inescapable fact was that there really was no way for Foxconn to deliver on time, on price, without violating labor rights. And so Apple, was in a sense a cause, but it, it, you could also describe it as a contributor, because it was Foxconn who actually uh, was, the, was the direct party. Um, and so we differentiated, uh, I don't, we don't need to uh, pursue this further, but we differentiated um, the, 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 the obligations, as it were, depending on uh, the type of linkage between a business enterprise um, and um, the um, actual harms committed. Now, another um, um, aspect of the guiding principles, which I think um, are uh, 
uh, important, um, is that, that, that you know, um, there are different forms of remedy. And we have focused um, heavily, um, including in the guiding principles, on obstacles to judicial remedy, which are, which are, which are uh, 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 pronounced in the area um, of, um, uh, of corporate globalization because of uh, the nature of the legal structure uh, of the corporation. Um, and so uh, the guiding <coughs> principles identify obstacles to judicial remedy and urge states to address them. But we also realize that there are, that providing remedy for harm can take many different forms. Um, and one of them um, is, uh, is through um, alternative dispute resolution mechanisms, um, which we began to pay close attention to. And it, it sort of occurred to me um, on, I think it was the first site visit I ever made to Yanacocha <coughs> um in uh, Cayamaca, Peru. Uh, shortly after the local community organizers um, had boycotted access to the mining site um, for an extended period of time. The people inside couldn't get out, nobody from outside could get in. They had the helicopter and food and, and other supplies. Eventually, the police and, and, and armed forces were called out and shots were fired. Um, and I, I, I met with the uh, community organizer, um, uh, a Jesuit priest um, named Father Arana, um, and we had an afternoon discussion about what, what had led to all of this. Um, and his answer was sort of indelibly inscribed in my mind. He said, they didn't pay any attention to us when we came to them with small problems, so we had to create a big one. Um, and that gave me an idea. Why not deal with the smaller problems before they <laughs> escalate into bigger ones? Um, you know, the Ken Saravigo case was not the beginning of Shell's problems in Nigeria. It was the culmination of a long series um, of ignoring uh, various um, um, community uh, protests um, and the like. So we um, started to um, push for greater attention to um, um, non-judicial remedy, not in place of judicial remedy, but because we know that judicial remedy is going to take time to develop, uh, and um, not all uh, uh, human rights harm uh, needs to be dealt with through judicial processes in the first place. Um, they can be state-based. Um, I met this afternoon with the advisory uh, committee or board um, of the of the uh, uh, national contact point of the OECD guidelines here um, in London. Um, and, um, but they can also be company-based. And so we started, we encouraged companies to consider setting up grievance mechanisms and we provided um, a legitimacy and effectiveness criteria for how they should operate. Um, and you know, when you think of it, in all, in the most robust legal systems, the, the, the majority of conflict is dealt with through non-judicial remedy. Why can't that be the case uh, at the international level if we can make these things work? Um, so that's um, the remedy uh, part. Then another analytical sort of lesson is, as you see, I call implementation through distributed networks. What do I mean by that? I mean by that that you know I'm, I'm, I've been in and around the United Nations for a long time. Um, it is the world's biggest repository of documents that no one pays any attention to. And I said to myself, I don't want to be one of those. And so, yes, I want the guiding principles to be endorsed by the Human Rights Council, and that is in itself important, but the UN has very weak implementation mechanisms in the area of human rights, um, and I, I want something more robust. So. I want to go to actors that actually have greater leverage over the business community um, than the United Nations does. The United Nations is a, is a, is a, ha, ha, has a, a values proposition. I also want to go to places that have value proposition to offer to business. So um, we started working very closely uh, with the OECD because they have the only sort of multinational complaints mechanism 
uh, and they were in the process of revising the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises, and we wanted to make sure that it included a human rights chapter, which it had never done before, and that it would be aligned with the UN guiding principles. And they essentially adopted the UN guiding principles as part of the OECD guidelines, almost verbatim. We went to the International Finance Corporation. Why? Because they have money that they co-invest with companies. Um, and said, your performance standards need to be better aligned with the UN guiding principles. Of course, we went to the European Union. Um, the International Organization for Standardization was developing ISO 26000, uh, uh, a social um, responsibility guidance. We wanted to make sure that the human rights uh, component and so on and so forth uh, uh, matched um, what, what we were trying to do. We worked very closely with the Global Compact. And, and after a while, um, institutions in developing countries began to um, show an interest for a variety of complex reasons um, which um, we can go um, into. Now, in addition to that, um, the guiding principles provide a common platform, but there have been many different apps, if you will. Elements of them, not the whole set, but elements of them, um, have, have, show, have shown up in national legislation, um, including uh, 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 reporting requirements for U.S. investors in Burma, um, the, uh, 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 the due diligence requirements um, of, of, of in conflict minerals uh, in Dodd-Frank, um, the uh, EU non-financial reporting requirements. Um, China recently issued um, a, an official guidance to its overseas mining companies, explicitly referencing the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, uh, and so on and so forth. So it shows up at national levels in different ways. Um, it's been endorsed by a bunch of business associations and um, uh, scores of companies. Um, I noticed the, the, the today's update of the Business and Human Rights Resource Center um, referenced a, a study that they've just done of what companies have done since 2011. I haven't had a chance to read it, uh, but you can look it up um, and, uh, and see what the results are. And um, this, is, this last one is interesting. Um, I spoke this morning at the uh, Global Law Summit that's taking place here in London. Um, the International Bar Association has developed guidelines for lawyers. Um, for law firms, as businesses in their own right, um, and for lawyers in their client advisory work, what you advise clients uh, with regard to business and human rights issues. So this, this is what I mean by implementation through distributed networks, right? It isn't something that the UN only is doing. In fact, the UN is a relatively minor player in the implementation of this. Um, it, it, it's, it's sort of cascaded. Um, uh, well, well beyond and into what I like to describe as the, the regulatory ecosystem for business and, and, and human rights. The earliest uptake, let's go back to the three governance systems. The earliest uptake in, in this distributed network scheme is in the due diligence requirements, um, non-financial reporting and the like, um, and in the grievance mechanisms, although this is still um, uh, a work in progress. And why? Because there is alignment across the three governance systems. For, for states uh, uh, requiring elements of human rights due diligence uh, helps fulfill the state duty to protect. Uh, for companies, um, it helps um, meet the uh, uh, responsibility to respect. Um, and for civil governance, uh, it reduces the incidence of human rights harm uh, in the first place. And so it makes sense that this should be um, uh, the areas that um, uh, led immediate, uh, most immediately to, uh, to early uh, uptake. So um, to pull this together, um, the guiding principles draw on the fact and the dynamics of polycentric uh, governance, that is to say, uh, the multiple governance system. Um, I avoided, like the plague, getting involved in a discussion of is voluntary better than mandatory, is mandatory better than voluntary, 
I said, look, I've never seen a society that is managed entirely by volunteerism, and, and, and all of the ones that are managed by top-down mandatory requirements have collapsed. Right? And so most societies have a smart mix of both. Why should it be any different in the area of business and human rights? We, we went out of our way to engage new communities of practice. And I indicated before that corporate lawyers turned out to be incredibly important um, in this because after, after a while, at first they were quite resistant, after a while they began to see that the, um, the guiding principles as we, laid, as we laid out the rationale behind them actually were a tool for risk management. Uh, and corporate lawyers, are one of their jobs is supposed to manage the risk <clears throat> uh, where, whether it's reputational, whether it's, it's uh, material, um, uh, whether it's operational. Um, and so they became serious advocates to the extent that the IBA, as I say, is issuing guidance, has issued uh, uh, draft guidance for law firms um, in in-house in counsel. Uh, the fourth point, um, and I'm using um, vocabulary developed by others here, um, uh, uh, Thin consent means you manage to squeeze something through an intergovernmental body and you twist enough arms in the coffee lounge. Say, you know, I'll vote for you in this resolution and if you agree to vote for this resolution. That's thin consent. You end up with a piece of paper that doesn't mean very much. Um, and so what, what we sought to do was to achieve thick consensus. That is to say, to have all the stakeholder groups buy into uh, the solution and to have them along on the journey, right? If you want people in with you at the landing, they've got to be in with you at the takeoff. Uh, and so we worked very closely from the beginning in a multi-stakeholder fashion to try to develop um, thick consensus rather than thin consent. And then the idea of um, implementation through distributed networks um, and the cascading effects um, that that has um, resulted in. The, um, so what's the outcome? Yeah, we, haven't, we, have not, we haven't solved the, all the challenges of business and human rights. Um, we're a long way from it. Uh, when I presented the guiding principles um, to the uh, Human Rights Council and urged um, the endorsement, I said, hey, this is not the end, but it is the end of the beginning. Um, if you endorse this, for the first time, we will have an authoritative set of guidance um, that um, uh, uh, that is, is the, that, or would be if you endorse it, the, the, the normative baseline, if you will, um, uh, uh, for, for uh, the global um, level. Um, and I might add that um, the, the, uh, the UN has never before endorsed a normative text that governments did not negotiate themselves. And when I presented this, um, I remember the Algerian ambassador took the floor and said, um, this, thank you so much for all your hard work over the last six years. This is terrific. Um, uh, this is an excellent product, and we should now submit it to an intergovernmental process for improvement. And um, I rarely lost it. <laughs> but I lost it on that occasion. Um, I said, look, you could never have produced this through an intergovernmental negotiation process. So for God's sakes, endorse it and move on. Um, and they did. <laughs> so the next final chapter is further international legalization. Um, last year, um, the, uh, in, in July, the Human Rights Council, by a plurality, adopted a resolution to um, commence negotiations on a business and human rights uh, treaty. Um, and um, they are scheduled to begin sometime uh, in, I think, June of this year. The main proponents were Ecuador and South Africa, joined by Bolivia, Cuba, and Venezuela. Um, they, uh, they're heavily supported by a treaty alliance of some 600 NGOs. Um, the US and the EU and Japan and South Korea have announced that they won't even participate in the negotiations uh, because they believe that it will suck the oxygen out of the room uh, and um, uh, of, of uh, further progress on business and human rights. 
and take us back to the kinds of debates that took place in the 1970s. Um, heavily um, skewed toward uh, north-south cleavages, which make less and less sense in the context of the United Nations, um, and, and less and less sense in the context of globalization, when by 2025, half of the global Fortune 500 companies are going to be in emerging markets. Right. So uh, it, it, we're no longer in the 1970s north-south universe. Um, what it seeks to do is to, is to, as I said, to go back in, to, to a, 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 a frame, framing that has failed in the past, to establish an overarching international legal framework governing multinationals. Um, interestingly, um, it excludes national companies, and that was done for political reasons. They needed to get the votes of enough small countries uh, in order to get the plurality that they had. And the condition was that they exclude national companies. And so under this treaty, um, the, the uh, retailers and the brands that sourced from Rana Plaza would be covered by the treaty. But the actual factories, locally owned, would not. Um, so um, I've been blogging and making a nuisance of myself, arguing that the issues are far too complex and the interests far too divergent for effective governance through a single treaty uh, instrument, um, that we need to recognize the growing fragmentation of international law and the, uh, and the regime collisions, as Günter Tardner calls it, that results um, from that. And, and, and a, a, a treaty would have to be pitched at such a high level of generality uh, that it wouldn't be of any use to anybody, to real people in real places. And so um, it is uh, a waste of time uh, unless its uh, parameters are fundamentally altered. Uh, and if they're not, my prediction is we see a replay of the 1970s um, um, negotiations which produced nothing or an equivalent to the Migrant Workers Convention, which has been in, in, in effect since, I think, 1995, which um, has not been endorsed by a single migrant worker receiving country. Okay. And so you, you want a treaty on multinational corporations that not a single home country of multinational corporations will adopt, you pursue the Ecuadorian strategy. Uh, affected communities deserve so I'm not simply complaining, I'm also proposing that what I call a precision tool alternative would be better, uh, uh, would better serve the needs um, of affected individuals and communities. And I, I've advocated a focus on gross abuses um, as a focal point um, of the negotiations. Um, why? Because of the severity of the abuses um, involved. Uh, because there is um, a good understanding of how the prohibitions uh, apply to natural persons. But there is considerable confusion and disagreement among states of how it should apply to legal persons. Um, and so my thinking has been uh, that um, this, might, this might be a, 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 a viable way to go, and it would have knock-on effects, that it would raise the visibility uh, of the issue uh, across the board. Uh, other possibilities exist. Professor Erica George, <coughs> some of you know, may be familiar with, has proposed sort of a global tra transparency regime um, as an alternative um, to the Ecuadorian proposal. And these, of course, are not mutually uh, exclusive. But from my way of thinking, what's important is to get away from the illusion that some overarching treaty uh, covering all aspects of business and human rights, one is feasible and two would make much of a difference. And in the meantime, widen and deepen implementation of the guiding principles. <coughs> Keep pushing in national corporate law for <coughs> directors paying due, due regard to the impact on society. Um, and we also need to push very hard on international investment agreements, uh, the bilateral investment agreements, the investment chapters of free trade agreements, uh, because of, the, of, of their uh, uh, constricting effects on national policy space uh, with regard to progressive legislation in the area of environment uh, and, and labor and, and other such things, and, and human rights. <coughs>
which may um, affect the, um, equili the, the uh, economic equilibrium um, that existed at the time that the agreements uh, were, were reached. So I've dis described this journey as a journey of principled pragmatism. Principled meaning absolutely committed to human rights and to the realization of human rights, but being fairly pragmatic about how to go about achieving it. And to avoid, at all cost, traditional doctrinal approaches, whether by states, whether by businesses, whether by uh, NGOs or advocates. Uh, and I believe that we have moved from what the Global Compact undertook, um, or it still undertakes, um, what I describe as the cognitive and institutional expansion. Um, we moved into the area of soft law standard setting through the guiding principles. Um, and uh, there is a potential for further legalization if it's done, international legalization, if it's done right. Um, if it's not, um, it's going to set back the agenda. Um, as I say, we've got a long way to go, but I, I, we should also realize that we have come a long way in the last 15 years. This discussion would, couldn't, could not have taken place um, 15 years ago. Um, so um, we, we need to do better, and um, you know, um, I, I'm done. Um, I'm counting on you guys. <laughs> Thank you. John, thank you very, very much for that. Very, very stimulating indeed. Uh, we've got a little time for questions from the floor. Uh, try and keep them short if you can, please. We have a question down here at the front. And then we have one back there. Get there. And then there's one here. So uh, perhaps if we could, if we could take, take you first, please, yeah. Um, in terms of developing enterprise risk management, oh, sorry, yeah. in terms of enterprise risk management, is there a case that one of the key challenges is that corporations don't want to hear bad news and these early warning signals are in effect bad news and people don't pass that up the communication channel? Okay, you want to take a few and then I'll... Yeah, yeah. Uh, Professor Raggi, yeah, hi. Hi. Um, you mentioned early in about um, targeting legal instruments, and I'm not sure whether this is appropriate, but uh, recently in the UK, uh, we, we brought out the, uh, the Bribery Act in 2010, um, which, which relates to um, uh, bribery and corruption associated with UK firms, but also ties in um, international subsidiaries. Um, how practical do you think that is when you know, we've got different views on, on what is right and what is norm in terms of doing business in, in, in different parts of the world? And we'll take one more question just over here. Thank you. Um, I wanted just to come back to something that was on the very first slide, I think, which was about um, extraterritorial jurisdiction by home states, which you said had um, limited possibilities. Could you elaborate on what you think those limited possibilities are. I mean, for us, I work for Tradecraft. I think for us it seems that there's an incredibly important gap at the moment and one which is really critical for driving better business behaviour, particularly from those companies that maybe Kofi Annan would have described as the non-angelic. <laughs> okay, um, in terms of, of risk management, um, you know, I wouldn't generalise um, um, uh, about that, uh, because um, corporate cultures can be very different, and legal cultures within companies can be very different. Um, you know, there was a, a, a famous quote from a, a former general counsel of Chevron, um, who said, "We will litigate till hell freezes over, and then we'll skate on." Um, now, his counterpart at Total um, um, had exactly the opposite philosophy um, um, after they got burned in Burma. Uh, and said, we're, we're into the prevention game. Uh, 
um, and we want to know what the problems are so that we can avoid them in the first place. So it, it's very difficult to generalize uh, across companies. Um, increasingly, with the, with the growing involvement of the, of the legal community um, and, and the, the American Bar Association endorsed the guiding principles, the IBA putting out guidance, I think, I think the, 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 uh, um, the trend line is shifting um, in, in, the, in the direction of, of, of let's prevent these things in the, from occurring in the first place, um, rather than um, uh, litigating till hell freezes over. Um, in terms of the Bribery Act, I'm, I'm not as familiar with the UK Act as I am with the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in the, in the, in the US. Um, you know, um, does, does, do facilitation payments still occur? Of course they do. Uh, uh, but um, major, uh, uh, major uh, 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 cases have been brought under the U.S. legislation, which um, doesn't apply only to U.S. companies, uh, right? It, it applies to companies that uh, operate, um, that have operations in the U.S. Uh, or are listed, uh, listed in the U.S. as well. Um, and it, it, um, it, it um, you know, I, I think Siemens uh, is, is a different company today than it was five years ago, uh, and the, the punishment hurt. Um, um, so I think these specifically targeted uh, pieces of legislation uh, can help, and that goes to the third question as well. Um, I think one, one, of the, one of the obvious um, foundations for extraterritorial jurisdiction. I mean, there, 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 it actually is a, is a, it, it isn't a single category. I once devised a, a, a six-cell matrix of extraterritorial jurisdiction. Um, one, one cell of which is purely domestic um, if, um, um, uh, to impose requirements on parent companies to more effectively regulate their own affiliates abroad, right? Um, that's not extraterritorial jurisdiction in the traditional sense, right? Um, and yet it hasn't been as much of a focus um, in, 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 in this debate um, as let Nigerians come to the U.S. to sue U.S. companies, that form of extraterritorial jurisdiction. Um, so it, 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 it's a differentiated category, it's a nuanced category. Um, it, de it, it depends heavily on, on having an appropriate jurisdictional basis. And one obvious jurisdictional basis would be some sort of a multilateral convention. Uh, and the most likely candidate for a multilateral convention, in my view, would be something focused on gross abuses. Which would then provide a basis for extraterritorial jurisdiction of a, of a more general kind. Uh, take maybe two more. Uh, so there's one here, and there's uh, and there's one up there. Could you keep your hands up so we can see where the microphones need to go? Or well, we can take them in that order. Yes. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rudy. Um, you made a reference towards, I think it was host government agreements and putting constraints on, on native uh, environmental and social requirements. Do you think that's uh, an area that you might make progress with in current investment law negotiations, or is, is that something you think would suck the oxygen out of the air? And then thank you very much, Professor Rudy, for the great talk. I mentioned about barriers to access to judicial remedies, and just building on that, I mean, for example, uh, CORE and ECCJ worked on a report on the third panel that identifies some of those barriers and looked at some of the opportunities for improvements, such as reversing the burden of proof. And I'm just wondering what your take was on perhaps one of the areas, the best areas for that. Um, in terms of host government agreements and, and bilateral <coughs> investment agreements, um, we actually did a fair amount of work on that, including um, um, we got access. Um, <coughs> through um, the IFC to, um, uh, I think it was 98 or something like that, contracts that the IFC was a party to um, as a co-investor or whatever. Um, and uh, we uh, did an analysis uh, of that and then the I we actually got the IFC to publish it. Um, it, it what, 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 what we tried to figure out is what are the determinants of these um, stabilization clauses and how they're phrased and framed and all the rest of it. 
Uh, is it, is it, a, is it a country risk? Uh, what is it? At the conclusion that we came to, it was bargaining power. It was as simple as that. Um, there were, there were, we, we came across um, a, a, a couple of contracts where the stabilization clause was going to be in effect for 50 years. And, 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 and it, it, it is inconceivable, right? Um, and, and, and it was with a very small African country that probably didn't have a clue what it was signing. Uh, and so capacity building in this area is crucially important. Um, and um, we, uh, we as, as I say, we spent a lot of time proselytizing um, about the, the, uh, the, the need um, for um, um, providing greater policy space uh, to governments. Now, the bilateral investment treaties are time bound, right? They're 10 to 15 years typically. Uh, and the newer generation of, of bilateral investment treaties are beginning to move in that direction. A number of countries have actually withdrawn from ICSID jurisdiction um, uh, because of the way in which the arbitration panels um, uh, work and so on and so forth. I mean, it, the, the system is, is, a, is an absolutely, um, it's necessary. It's, you know, we used to do gunboat diplomacy uh, if a country nationalized a, a company. Um, and now, now we have arbitration panels, and that's progress, right? That's real progress. No, it is. It's, 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 it, and it contributes to the rule of law. But um, a, a, um, uh, an, a, 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 a legal scholar who's also an arbitration, um, 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 uh, an, 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 an involved in, in arbitration, uh, wrote a paper um, looking at five cases under the Argentina um, U.S. bilateral investment treaty after the uh, early uh, 2000s collapse uh, in Argentina. Um, there are five cases, almost identical, five different companies brought cases. Um, and um, they all came to different conclusions. Um, one awarded, I think, think it was $200 million uh, to uh, the company. Um, uh, and, and another said, uh, there is no liability here um, under this bilateral investment treaty. That's not, that's not a viable judicial system. We need, we need to improve that. And perhaps an appellate procedure of some kind. Uh, the problem is there is no centralized place to go, right? In, 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 in trade disputes, you go to the WTO. In investment disputes, um, th there isn't a centralized entity uh, that you can go to. Um, so, yeah, we care a lot about that uh, and, and uh, yeah, actually ran several training sessions for African negotiators as part of the mandate. Uh, in terms of access to justice, you know, um, uh, I've, I've said publicly that um, the <coughs> guiding principles um, are much better at describing the problem than fixing it. Um, but I've also said that that's true of most NGO reports on the subject as well. It's damn hard. It's damn hard. Uh, uh, and, and it's just something you have to keep working at uh, and keep pushing at. Um, there, isn't, there, isn't a, there, is no, there is no silver bullet on that one. Um, uh, and, and measures, um, in fact, some countries have moved in, in the wrong direction. Um, I won't mention anyone in particular until, until tomorrow at 7.15 when my plane takes off. <laughs> Thank you very much. On the, on the note that we should keep working, perhaps the time is now to stop working. Um, Professor Reggie, I'd like to thank you on behalf of everybody for a really wonderful lecture. Uh, all of you, uh, we are hosting a reception over in North Cloisters. For those of you who know UCL, there'll be students to help direct you across the road and into the right place. If you'd like to join us for a drink, a chance to meet a few people, uh, and just uh, ask you to thank John in the normal way.